So we are recording this call. Welcome everyone. Okay, this is not a webinar, just so you all know, this is a meeting. This is a strategy session where we're building on a discussion from last month and we are supporting jail-based voting efforts. So I hope everybody came ready to engage and talk and strategize and hear about steps on launching jail-based voter efforts and then also ready to identify how you, if you're not already doing it, can get started in your community or in your jurisdiction. All right, well, I think we can go ahead and get started. Dana, can you go back to that first um, slide? Yeah, the goal slide, thanks Dana. So everybody, I'm Nicole with the Sentencing Project. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Dana and I are co-hosting this meeting where we're welcoming Mike Brickner, who's the current Executive Director of the ACLU of Delaware and is formerly with All Voting as Local. We're gonna be talking today about uh, establishing and running jail-based voter efforts to fight felony disenfranchisement, de facto disenfranchisement. We're gonna be sharing specific stories and examples of advocacy approaches to enfranchising jail uh, voters who are in jail and other disenfranchised voters. We're hoping that this conversation can be the start of many conversations between now in November and even after that, that connects jail, that connects advocates who are interested in running jail-based voter efforts together in support of those efforts and to ensure that people have access to the franchise and access to the ballot. And um, then we are going to ask as we wrap up the discussion today that folks commit to taking action. They commit to one action, even if it's modest, on next steps that you can do individually or maybe together with folks in your jurisdiction or in your state around supporting jail-based voter efforts. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about. This is not a webinar, that we are going to share out some best practices and examples of ways to get started. But we also want to offer dialogue and strategizing time so that we can get people on the path to establishing and creating jail-based voter efforts if you haven't already done so. And then also touch base around issues or barriers or challenges that people may be struggling with or through, and then identify ways that we can support you in addressing those challenges in support of access to the, to the um, to the ballot and ensure people have access to the ballot. Yes, this this meeting is being recorded. We will make it available online, probably on the Sentencing Project YouTube channel and maybe identify other places that it can be posted. And we'll also share out any materials. In fact, there is a Google Drive folder that we will make sure that you all have the link to so that you can identify resources and other materials and make use of those in your own state-based campaign. Dana, can you go to the next slide? So this is a meeting, it's a strategy session. We, so we wanna reinforce norms for our, our time together this afternoon, including the fact that we wanna invite all participants to mute yourselves. If not, I as the host will do that. Um, we're gonna have time for dialogue for everybody to weigh in and provide feedback or uh, comments or questions or stories about your own advocacy and organizing. And we want to hear from you, but we also want to be mindful and respectful of the time that people have today. And so if you are going a little bit too long, I will politely nudge you and may take liberties as the host to um, meet you. I don't want to do that, but we are not pressed for time per se, but we want to give time for everybody um, to participate to the extent that there's capacity to do so. I want everybody to share in making space. Um, you all are doing great work all over the country and you all are committed advocates. And we wanna hear about all the things that you're doing, but we may not have time to hear about all those things right now, okay? 
So um, I want you to share those things with us to the extent we have time this afternoon to do that. And if not, let's follow up. Let's engage about what you're doing over email or figure out another way to share that out. But today, as we go through the agenda and as we go into an opportunity for dialogue and discussion, make space for people who may not have had an opportunity to share before. So if you've made a comment, maybe today that's just that one comment you make, and then you, you figure out an opportunity to share out um, your stories or your best practices at another time. And then lastly, we want to encourage you all to be, and everyone on the call and on, in, in the meeting to be respectful this afternoon as we identify next steps and ways to ensure people can vote from jail going into November. So that's where we are. Um, I want to encourage everybody and people have already done so, post in the chat where folks are from. We're going to try to make connections to people on the call this afternoon and then perhaps um, support those connections uh, going forward as we go into November. I want everybody to know 184 people signed up for the strategy meeting today. That what that builds on the more than 700 people that registered for the jail, the voting from jail webinar last month. So there is a fairly large constituency around this. Um, and we're excited to welcome you all and to be in community with you all this afternoon. So with that, I'm going to turn the call over to Dana. Hi, everyone. Um, so as Nicole said, my name is Dana Pikowski, and I work at the Campaign Legal Center, where I focus on um, jail-based disenfranchisement. Um, and so I'm going to sort of spend this time to give everyone a little bit of background on this issue, just so that we're clear on sort of like the nuts and bolts of, you know, what you need to do to sort of start thinking about this issue and taking action um, for yourself. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to flag is that, um, you know, we noticed on the registration that there are some number of you who might be um, working for a locality or a state. And so we are going to have a follow up conversation later on um, that talks about uh, policy issues. And we're going to, you know, we hope that this is, you know, again, just, you know, one of the first in a series of conversations we're all going to be having about how to um, improve ballot access for eligible voters in jail. Um, and also, just separately, it is so exciting to see all of you in the chat from all over the country um, being really excited about this because, you know, I think that there currently isn't really enough being done in this space. And so everything that we're doing is, um, is really important and, and meeting a really important need. So um, to start off, just the basics, um, jails versus prisons. So I think when we talk about incarcerated voters, a lot of people assume that because you're incarcerated, um, you've been convicted of something or that you're, um, that you're, you're serving time, yeah, because of a conviction. And so one of the crucial di distinctions that we all need to know and that is, you know, important here is the difference between jails and prisons. So um, a jail is ordinarily locally run. That's not true in every single state, but it is true in the vast majority of states run by a city or a county. Um, about 60%. 60% 60, 60 of people usually are held in jails pretrial, which means that they haven't been convicted of anything, and in many cases are only incarcerated because they can't afford to pay bail. Um, and then, you know, the last third of people who are serving sentences in jail are often there serving time for low-level misdemeanor convictions um, that have sentences related to them that are um, less than a year in duration. Prisons, on the other hand, often incarcerate people who are post-conviction for felonies. Um, and they have sort of longer term uh, facilities and they're often op operated by a statewide department of corrections. Um, and so, as I mentioned earlier, or I guess maybe to clarify, most of what we're talking and thinking about here will be focused on jails because jails um, incarcerate most of the sort of population of eligible incarcerated voters. And, and we'll talk about why that is um, in a little bit. But so as we're thinking about how we wanna work with jails, one of the things we need to know is, you know, who, who runs them. And so, you know, when, when you're doing this, it'll mostly be a local sheriff, um, like a county sheriff, or someone who works in the city. Um, and then, you know, we gave a little bit of a preview to this, 
Um, but most of the people who are incarcerated in jails, again, are there pretrial. Um, but because of the way that pretrial detention works and jailing works, the jail population is disproportionately made up of people of color, particularly Black and Latino people, um, and low-income people, again, who can't afford to pay, uh, to pay bail. So this gets us to sort of a crucially important point in thinking through um, why we're working in jails, which is understanding how contact with the criminal justice system can result in disenfranchisement. So in this country, every single state gets to uh, enact their own laws that determine voter eligibility. And in the vast majority of states, um, a conviction for a felony uh, offense results in some kind of disenfranchisement. So maybe that disenfranchisement is just for the term of incarceration. So when you're released, you're automatically your rights are restored. And in many contexts though, that uh, disenfranchisement can last even longer, maybe into parole or probation. In the vast majority of states though, a misdemeanor conviction does not impair your eligibility. So even if you're incarcerated, you're still eligible to vote, even if you've been convicted of a misdemeanor. And then in every single state, pretrial detention never, never, never implicates your right to vote at all. So if you are in pretrial detention and you're eligible to vote before you are incarcerated, you remain eligible to vote during your incarceration until or if you ever receive a disqualifying felony conviction. Um, and so eligibility laws can be very confusing. They're different state to state, but they're really, really important things for you to understand as you do this work. Um, because if you, you know, help someone or facilitate voting with someone who you think might be eligible but isn't, them voting can be um, something that carries with it sort of uh, criminal consequences, right? It would be sort of a, 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 an instance of maybe voter fraud. And many of you guys might have heard of Crystal Mason, but in many states, um, the, the state attorney general is sort of stepping up prosecutions for people with past criminal convictions who vote by mistake. And so we just want to be really certain that when we're helping someone get access to the ballot, that we're not exposing them to any sort of potential additional criminal consequences, um, you know, particularly if they've had previous contact with the criminal justice system. So the last thing I want to say about that too, though, is that even if someone does have a disqualifying uh, previous criminal conviction, there is a chance that they could have their rights to vote restored. And so uh, CLC, where I work, um, offers a resource out there for people who are you know, looking for information about the felony disenfranchisement laws in their state, and will give um, folks information about what rights restoration processes are out there and available for, for you, and will help either directly impacted folks or folks who are facilitating voting for these people, um, sort of to walk through the rights restoration process. Um, so uh, I see in the chat, CLC stands for Campaign Legal Center, which is where I work. And I'm very sorry that I, uh, that I did that um, without saying it, but it is just habit. <laughs> All right, so now that we have some background on understanding voter eligibility, um, I want to talk a little bit about, um, and we've sort of also gone through the, the sort of infrastructure with jails, like who's in charge and, and how they work. I want to go into the elections infrastructure. And so one of the things that might be true for many of the people on this call is that you're coming either from the voting space or from the sort of criminal justice reform space. Maybe you've been an activist for a long time in one or the other areas, but because of the nature of this work, um, we all need to have a literacy of both of these sort of institutions and how they work together to create disenfranchisement in this space so that we can work within both of them to, to solve that problem. So, um, understanding sort of how elections work. Um, like jails, most elections are run locally. So you will likely have a local county clerk or a county recorder or a local board of elections who's in charge of you know, fulfilling absentee ballot request for absentee ballot requests, um, you know, running local polling locations, things like that. Usually above them in the sort of pecking order of things is a statewide agency like the Secretary of State or a statewide Board of Elections that makes the rules that um, govern these local officials. 
And so the vast majority of the work that you would be doing if you're doing direct outreach work in this space would be with the local officials. And if you want to do policy work, I think that there's an opportunity to do local policy work as well as statewide. Um, and so the, the other thing that's, that's worthwhile to learn about, and that is very different state to state, but is also sort of common across states in some ways, is understanding what mechanisms your state provides for people to vote. And so those mechanisms you know, can, are always in-person voting, right? Like if you are not incarcerated, you can turn up at your polling, local polling place and cast a ballot. There are also absentee voting. Um, and so as you're thinking, absentee voting, I think is the primary way that people who are in jail um, have access to the ballot. And so if we're going to do direct outreach programs or you know, try and build infrastructure for voting in jail, it's important that we understand how that, that program works. Um, what are the deadlines that are binding on people who need to request absentee ballots? Um, you know, what kind of hoops do they need to jump through, et cetera. And then also some other states might have alternatives um, to these two means of voting. And this can be emergency voting, something that's known as emergency voting, or other kinds of disability um, accommodations that will in some way have the, the, the county officials bring a ballot to someone who is maybe hospitalized, who's maybe confined in a jail um, in some states or you know, otherwise unable to vote in person, but who you know, can't uh, take advantage of absentee voting. And so all, you know, between absentee voting and alternative voting mechanisms, um, you know, those would be the kind of main avenues through which you would facilitate voting in a jail. Um, and so then the last thing that I think is worth paying attention to and, and being mindful of is that local officials also are responsible for, in some, in some capacity or another, voter registration and, and education, like publishing election deadlines, um, making sure people are registered. And so that is another thing that we wanna make sure that folks in jail have access to. Um, and so, um, so then the last thing that I want to talk about is to kind of like bring this all together and talk about this term that we keep throwing around, which is jail-based disenfranchisement. So what do we mean when we say jail-based disenfranchisement? Unlike felony disenfranchisement, where there is one law, right, and it says if you have a felony conviction, you can't vote. When we're talking about jail-based disenfranchisement, we're talking about a series of formal and informal barriers that make it incredibly difficult for people to vote from jail. And so a form, an example of a formal barrier might be if you live in a state that has an absentee ballot request deadline that is two weeks ahead of election day, actually it's pretty long, but maybe like eight days ahead of election day. Everyone who's incarcerated after those eight days doesn't have access to absentee voting. And so finding alternative access to the ballot will be at times difficult and in other instances impossible. So that's, that's one barrier. But the other barriers can be, you know, things that are just inherent in what it is to be incarcerated in a jail. So um, a lot of jails have really uh, complicated restrictions governing, governing mail. And so some jails have mail requirements that don't allow letters to come into and out of jails, which can prevent ballots from getting into and out of jails. They might have a lot of delays in their jail mail system. Um, there might be sheriffs who don't realize that people in their jail are eligible to vote and so mistakenly tell people that they can't request absentee ballots or won't help them facilitate voting. Um, and that's true similarly of, of county election officials who might you know, just misunderstand the law and not realize that they have any obligation to provide people who are incarcerated in jails with alternative access to the ballot or any access to the ballot at all. And so these are the kinds of barriers that when you're in jail, right, you have no control over um, your autonomy, you don't have access to the internet, you don't have free or easy access to a phone, um, you don't have access to information necessarily over the news or anything else. And so you have to rely on either these institutional actors like sheriffs and election officials to give you these information, the information, the ballot request forms, the resources that you need to vote, or third parties like volunteers, um, friends and family, things like that. And so um, because your people who are incarcerated voters are so dependent on others, if those other people can't, won't, or don't know how to give them this information, then they won't be able to cast their ballot. And so our task here is to make sure that 
the infrastructure is in place so that people who um, are eligible incarcerated voters can actually cast their ballots. And so one thing that we wanted to say briefly is that we know that COVID-19 exacerbates every single one of these issues that make voting in jail already difficult. Um, so many jails are on lockdown because of fears of COVID-19 um, spreading in jails. Um, and so, so in this time, getting access, direct access to jails um, might be even more difficult. And for people in jails, getting access to people on the outside or resources could similarly be um, very difficult. So we just wanted to flag that we're aware of that. And as a result, it might change our approach to this work um, in some way. And so the last thing that we wanted to go over is really understanding why this work is important. And we listed a couple of reasons here, but we would love it if you um, put in the chat what's bringing you to the table today and what you think is really important about this work. And so, you know, the things that, that we listed are, you know, number one, people in jail um, are a microcosm of groups who have been historically marginalized in elections. Um, that's um, people of color, that is people who have disabilities, people who are low income. And so when we're doing this work, we're really trying to make, um, to elevate the voices of people who have been historically excluded from our democracy. You know, I think that there's a democratic accountability um, issue here where voters who are in jail have directly experienced and have a, a direct advantage into how many elected officials like sheriffs, DAs, judges um, do their job. And so they are in many ways best positioned to, to hold them accountable when they're abusing their power or um, doing, uh, doing poorly. And then the last one is that being in jail is, jails are built to be disempowering. They're built to deprive people of their agency um, and to take away a lot of their sense of control and community connection. And so by doing this work, I think a lot of our purpose here is to, um, you know, help empower people who've been put in this position that is by design disempowering. So if anyone else has any uh, reasons that we haven't listed or, um, you know, thoughts on, uh, on why this work is important or what's bringing you here, we'd love to hear it. Um, and we also have about five minutes for questions about all this information. I know we dumped a lot on you guys. So um, if anyone wants to speak up, please, uh, say so in the chat and, and we're happy to kind of unmute you. And I know Mike has been doing some great work to answer questions too, which is, which is really wonderful. Um, Dana, I saw a couple questions uh, from folks about um, how do they know if voting in jail is legal in their state? Um, do, I know Campaign Legal Center has a resource on that. Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah, so we have um, a resource called restoreyourvote.org, which will help um, you sort of work through whether a conviction is disqualifying and what the relevant rules are in your state. I think also many states have lots and lots of local resources on this. If you just Google like felony conviction voting your state, um, the rules about criminal disqualification will usually come up. And then there will be disqual. I mean, there will be sort of complicated edge cases, right? Like there will be somebody who has a criminal conviction in a different state, and you don't know how it um, would be sort of considered under your state laws. And so that's when sort of reaching out to us and looking at restore your vote will be helpful. Um, but definitely, 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 just take a brief moment um, and look at the laws in your state. They're they're usually um, not that difficult to find, even if they might be a little difficult to understand. I mean, if they are difficult to understand, definitely you know, reach out and, and we're happy to kind of like help you think through what, what they're all about. Great, thanks Dana. And um, you know, one uh, person asked, how do we know that people, that officials are actually registering people to vote in jail? I mean, they, they in response to an advocate or organizer's question, they may say, oh yeah, we're registering people to jail. How can we trust that? What, what, what advice or guidance do we have for the community organizers on the phone? I mean, on the call who are interested in this and when they get these reactions or, or comments from jailers or, or sheriff's offices. Um, I, I'll, I'll jump in first. One of the things that I've done in the past is um, use the power of the public records request. Um, you know, we all have those in our states. Um, I know different states vary on what is available to the public, but um, we, we had uh, a, 
uh, Board of Elections that I worked with um, in Ohio and, and a sheriff uh, who said, well, we bring in the Board of Elections every single election season. And of course, we make sure everyone gets a ballot and everyone who wants to vote gets a ballot. And so we requested the information from the Board of Elections. And what we found was out of th this was a facility that held over a thousand people and only six of them cast a ballot. And so we were able to then go back to the Board of Elections and the sheriff and say, well, here's what's actually happening with your program. And you know, you may be having people come in, but it's not an effective program. And so we need to rethink how this is going to be. So you can. Um, and I'll also add on that because that is exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> that in the sort of, we're, we're sharing with you guys a library of resources that we've pulled together on this. And in that includes a little bit of an FAQ on like how to submit a public records request, um, including a link to a website that will give you a form letter that is specific to your state and ex explains your state's public records law and some sample letters that we've sent out. And so those sample letters, um, or sample public records requests can do everything from ask a jail what is your jail voting policies? What exactly are you doing to the accountability measure of how many people have actually voted um, from your jail and, and what are the sort of participation rates? Um, and so hopefully that will be a helpful uh, resource to all of you. And I also, I was a little bit remiss in, in the first question in that I didn't further emphasize. So in every single one of your states, most of the people who are incarcerated in a jail will be eligible. Um, you know, because so many people in jail are there pre-trial, the felony disenfranchisement laws that we're talking about do not apply to them uh, because they have no conviction. So the important point here is to focus on whether the people you're working with have a conviction and in a jail, few people do. Um, this can become a little bit more complicated in states where a previous conviction can disqualify you. And so maybe someone is not, is pretrial at this point, but has you know something disqualifying in their past. But, um, that's not gonna be true everywhere. And so when you're talking about people in pretrial detention, the important question is, were they eligible before they were in jail? And if they were, then they remain eligible when they, um, during the term of their incarceration. So I just wanted to make that super clear because I, you know, I think I should have started there. Um, and I know we have to move on. We do to... have to move on, but there's probably, we have probably have a minute left and I wanted to answer some of the questions that were posted in the chat. Veronica asked, how will we receive the library resource list? Well, there will be a Google shared drive that will be shared in the chat. The link to will be shared in the chat that includes some of the resources that Dana has mentioned. And we can always reshare that with folks um, over email. And we'll make sure that you all have our contact information. There's a lot of comments in the chat. Um, one comment from Deborah says, jail populations are very transient under non-COVID conditions. How often would you recommend voter registration drives in jail take place? So that is a, that's a question. We may get to it in the next section with how to build an effective advocacy campaign or advocacy effort. Mike, is that something you want to respond to now or do you think you'll touch on that when you um, speak? I, I, I can touch on that in the conversation, absolutely. Okay. Um, just sort of going through. Okay, well, I think we got to some of the questions. Folks do uh, post new questions in the chat and we'll try to get to them. We're also going to open up this meeting for discussion. We have 87 people on the call. Appreciate all of your time this afternoon. Again, there's a strong interest in this. Um, but now we'll move on to Mike, who will talk about establishing and launching effective advocacy efforts. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Nicole. And um, just uh, to say a little bit about my experience working uh, in jail voting, um, right now I'm the executive director of the ACLU of Delaware. Uh, but prior to that, uh, I worked for two years for an organization called All Voting is Local. I was the Ohio State Director. Uh, we were based, at, were based out of the um, Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights. And there, uh, we worked a lot on uh, setting up uh, jail voting programs. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the ACLU in Ohio. And there, we had also worked on uh, jail voting programs um, in a few uh, counties uh, in the state of Ohio. So. Um, I have a lot of experience there, and um, I also I was at All Voting as Local. I also worked uh, assisting folks in other states uh, that we worked in um, on jail voting. So it's something that I care 
uh, very much about and have had a lot of experience working with community partners, with uh, law enforcement officers, and with elections officials to make sure that this happens. Um, and, and I think that that really um, is such an important point that I want to highlight for people is that, um, you know, as Dana said, in pretty much every state across the country, people who are uh, in jail pretrial have the right to vote, but it's really just a right on paper until somebody actually goes into the jail to make sure that it happens. That unfortunately, and we saw that with some of the comments in the chat section, is that, you know, people in jail are oftentimes, you know, dealing with legal problems, they might be uh, contending with having to potentially lose their job, lose their housing, have childcare woes. Now they're dealing with a global pandemic in jails. And so oftentimes, you know, casting your ballot suddenly falls to kind of the bottom of the list. And many people might not even know that they're entitled to vote. And so, you know, oftentimes, unfortunately, um, you know, uh, sheriffs and uh, jails and elections officials are not proactively going in there. Uh, so it's oftentimes up to us as advocates to be the ones to sometimes go in or to work with our law enforcement and elections officials to make sure that they're the ones that are doing it too. Um, some of the basics that I would just say if you're getting involved in this work is um, just to understand some of the um, privilege that you bring into the space um, that, you know, you are a person who is uh, not uh, incarcerated and you're going into a space where, you know, they're, they're you know, jails are supposed to be short term uh, uh, places for people to stay. But I oftentimes ran into folks who were waiting, awaiting their trial, who had been there for 150 days or 200 days. Um, and so you're, you're walking into, um, you know, people who are, uh, who have had their liberty taken away from them and who are struggling on a whole variety uh, of levels. Um, I, I would also encourage you to use um, people first language. I know that when we start talking about corrections, people oftentimes use words like inmates and prisoners and, um, and that that's oftentimes sort of the technical jargon that people in corrections use. Um, I think we as advocates should make sure to, um, you know, talk about people who are incarcerated as people first, right? Um, and that that's really important to affirm their, their dignity and their humanity. Um, the other important thing is to um, abide by the rules and restrictions uh, in the jails um, that and we'll talk a little bit more about how to get to know what some of those rules and restrictions are. Um, every jail is different. Um, and, and so different sheriffs, different uh, officials may have different rules for you uh, to come in. Um, some of those rules might be really different right now, especially because of COVID-19. Um, but we'll talk about how to make sure that you're following um, those rules. Um, and then lastly, just be mindful of items you bring and wear on registration day or when you're collecting uh, uh, absentee ballot applications. Um, you know, we are uh, one uh, all, you know, nonpartisan, nonprofit organizations and really important to maintain that uh, that neutrality um, and, and, and uh, making sure that you are open to um, all voters. And then um, also just making sure again that there may be certain rules uh, with the um, uh, uh, sheriff and with the jail uh, in terms of what types of uh, clothing you can bring in. Um, we can go to the next slide. So I wanna talk really briefly about um, uh, a variety of different potential uh, advocacy uh, 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 way, ways that you can go about this. Um, because you know, I really wanna stress that we're all coming from different states and different communities around the country, right? And jails particularly are hyper-local and um, you know, your political landscape might look very, very different depending on uh, where you are. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I, I think, most popular ways uh, is to actually do, you know, direct voter outreach programs in jails. And um, again, that direct outreach oftentimes starts with yourself and maybe finding another existing civic group that's interested in this and actually going to the uh, local sheriff or to the local elections officials um, and advocating that your group come in and do voter registration 
and do uh, absentee balloting. Um, on the question of timing, if you were to create one of these voter registration programs, um, you know, it, it can be, especially, you know, depending on the jail that you're going into, it can be a really um, a strenuous process for your volunteers. If you're going to a small jail that has, you know, 20 beds, you can do that pretty easily in a quick shift. But uh, I was partnering with organizations. We went to a jail that had over 2,000 people um, and multiple pods. It would usually take about three days for us to go through that jail and register and get absentee ballots for those individuals. And so we would usually plan to go into that jail uh, uh, right before the cutoff for voter registration. So we would usually actually even try and time it with like a National Voter Registration Day event and go into the jail, register people, because also, at least in Ohio, and this should also be true for many of your other states, you can fill out a voter registration form or an update form if the person has to update their voter registration. And they can also fill out a request for an absentee ballot at that same time. Um, what's also, so what's nice about that is that you can get both of those turned into your Board of Elections uh, ahead of time. And um, then the person is all set up to be able to vote from jail and, and they're registered and you know that their registration is going to be valid. Um, the next thing that you can do though is that you can also focus your local advocacy specifically on the elections officials and sheriffs. Um, as I said, like going into some jails can be very difficult and very burdensome for volunteer groups to be able to do. And sometimes we don't always have the capacity uh, to be able to do that. Um, so sometimes it's better to push with the local elections officials and the jail officials to beef up their voter engagement plans to make sure that they even have a jail voting plan in the first place, but to make sure that they're going in regularly and informing voters about their rights, getting the paperwork to them and making sure that that jail voting is actually happening. One of the other things too is that, you know, think about just as um, with anything else in the justice system, there's a, a long continuum of um, people who have different involvement with the justice system. So you might also even look at beyond just uh, focusing on changes to uh, uh, make jail voting happen, you could also have changes to help enfranchise people once they come out of jail. So for instance, um, one of the advocacy strategies that I did um, a few years ago um, at the ACLU of Ohio was we advocated with one of the local really large jails in Ohio um, to include a voter registration form and information uh, uh, with every um, uh, discharge packet for everybody who is leaving the jail. And so uh, they had information about their right to vote uh, whenever, when, as soon as they left and were able to get registered to vote um, immediately. We then uh, kicked that uh, process a little bit more into higher gear. Uh, and in following years, we actually would have uh, voter registration people there on days where people were uh, being discharged from the, from the jail um, and even have representatives from the boards of elections there. So um, that can also be a way that you can get people engaged and uh, registered and ready to go. Um, the other thing though is also thinking about the statewide advocacy to create election infrastructure in jails. And this I think is especially important right now. And this goes to the question I saw in chat earlier around COVID-19. So what we've seen across the country with the COVID-19 pandemic is that when election officials don't plan for the emergencies, then the people who are most uh, marginalized, who um, have the most uh, uh, hurdles to jump to get their ballot cast, will not get their ballot cast. And that speaks directly to folks in jail. And I think it's really interesting that Dana brought up um, folks who are hospitalized or in nursing homes because if you think about the situations that those individuals are, where you might be hospitalized last minute, you weren't planning to be hospitalized. Most folks in jail were not planning to be in jail either. Um, and you think about people in nursing homes, those are congregate settings, just like jails, where people can't really uh, uh, socially distance that easily. And there's a, a high likelihood of you know, COVID-19 transmission. Elections officials are having to come up with plans right now for those folks uh, uh, to, to make sure that folks in nursing homes and uh, who are hospitalized can vote. 
And so it could be part of your advocacy now to also be pushing for the state to also include jailed voters in that infrastructure to make sure that we have a plan together for whatever the pandemic brings us uh, in 2020. And you know that that plan can then be in place also then for all future elections um, uh, past that. So um, I wanna go through, um, Dana, you can move to the next slide now. So I wanna just you know kind of give us a, a grounding of some of the things that we might need to um, think about if we wanted to engage in a uh, jail voting program. And these questions here also kind of help maybe answer for you what type of advocacy you want to go down. Um, you know, the first thing that uh, you want to uh, know about are what are the rules and regulations for both voting and for the jail. Um, so for me, when I first started learning about the ability to vote in jail, um, I started to look on the Ohio Secretary of State's website and um, I uh, started to learn more about how to um, uh, do jail voting in uh, each of the jails. Similarly, I would look up on the website, uh, what are some of the rules and restrictions in some of the various jails that we were, that we were going to look at. So one of the things that I learned first was, oh, if I'm going into a jail, I have to uh, uh, have a, a pen because the Secretary of State requires all forms to be filled out on a pen, but I'm not allowed to bring a pen into the jail because that's a rule that the jail has. So how are we going to get ink pens to the people who are incarcerated in the jail for them to fill that out? Um, then also looking at existing work. So are there other organizations that are already working on this? Um, is this just, is this something where another group can fill in? Who are the decision makers um, that you need to reach out to? So this might be, is this the sheriff that controls this? Is this a jail administrator? Um, what about the role of city council or uh, the mayor in your community? If they've been speaking out about um, criminal justice reform and um, helping with reentry and recidivism, maybe they can be uh, a way to go. I know our county reentry coordinator was always really helpful. Um, our local public defenders were great partners as well. Um, and that goes to who those partners might be. So again, reentry folks, uh, people who are public defenders. Also think about some of those social workers in your local jail, people who do education. Um, but the last thing I would uh, really emphasize for you all is also thinking about cultural competency and who should be leading this work. So an example I would give just really quickly is um, we worked in one jail with one uh, partner who had been going into the jail for a number of years in Ohio, and they were a mostly white-led organization, and they were going into a jail that had at least half of their population were black, and they got very low numbers of return rates of people coming in, and so we worked with a local uh, young black professionals group to uh, uh, help supplement some of the work and uh, had people from the community actually then going in and helping to register folks. And we saw that the uh, registration and absentee ballot numbers actually went up about 700% uh, once we had the young black professionals go in. And so oftentimes, you know, it, it's to our benefit to make sure that, you know, the communities that are most impacted are the ones who are centered and the ones that are leading the work. So, um, I think that that's pretty much it. The next screen uh, starts to walk us through a little bit about power mapping. Nicole, did you want to say something? Yeah, no, I was just um, grateful for your comments and grateful for your um, insight into how you got started in Ohio and the suggestions you have for other folks who are getting started or any feedback that you might have for people who are currently running efforts and might be looking for best practices or way to troubleshoot. So the power um, mapping activity is just, we wanted to give people food for thought in terms of identifying who in the community to connect with and how to get a campaign effort started in your local jurisdiction. We don't really have time to go through this this afternoon but this PowerPoint will be shared with all of you. And for people who are new to organizing and new to uh, mobilizing community coalitions, hopefully this slide can offer ways to get started and ways to think through 
how you launch a campaign yourself and who you might interact with or um, work with to get something started in your jurisdiction. Dana, did you have any feedback or uh, suggestions for how people can use this this, af this afternoon and ways we can follow up with them on it going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we're gonna move into is a little bit of discussion. And um, in this section, we'd hope to kind of think through with everyone how you might be agile or flexible as you move forward in doing this work. So thinking through, okay, like I've taken stock, I've done a personal accounting, and this is the things that I know and the skills that I have, like who should I bring into this work with me? How will my work change if I have a cooperative sheriff versus a sheriff who's really resistant to having people in the jail, um, et cetera. And so I think as we move into discussion, it, it would, you know, we just encourage you all to sort of do a little bit of that work internally and maybe even, you know, grab a pen and paper and start answering some of these questions for yourself. And, you know, just finally recentering ourselves is like, we want to take away here for, to be for everyone who's on this call to commit to taking one next step to either um, start doing this work in their community or think about what the next step for pushing forward the work that they're already doing um, will be. And so at the end of the call, we're going to ask people to share out and we'd love it if, if folks would, would take advantage of that. Yeah, um, and I think that um, if people can think about that and maybe post those in the chat, the chat is being recorded. We'll also save the chat. We're going to do some work on our end, Dana and I, and making connections to you all um, so that people who are on the call this afternoon from the same jurisdictions, including states and cities, can be in community together around either running effective jail-based um, campaigns or getting new ones started. And then I noticed that some of you have already made those connections to each other in the chat, and that's really encouraging and exciting to see. But now we have about 12 minutes left before the top of the hour. We do want to leave a few minutes at the before we wrap up so that people can share out what next steps they're committed to taking this afternoon. But right now, we did want to open it up for dialogue. People are muted, and so we're going to ask folks to unmute themselves if you have anything to share or any questions um, that have uh, bubbled up for you. And then I see that Ann Mulligan has um, had her hand raised. So we're gonna to go to you first, Dan, and then others, feel free to post a question in the chat or um, we'll invite you to unmute yourself. But at this point, I'm gonna to go to Anne and have and unmute her. If I can. Or Anne, maybe you'll have better luck in meeting yourself since I'm... or you can post your comment in the chat and we'll read it for you. Does anyone else have any comments or um, questions that they want to post this afternoon? Yes. Go ahead. So I'm Nicole and I am from the Out for Justice, a nonprofit org that has been leading on voting work in Maryland um mm, since the organization started we've been doing this this voting work because it, it impacts our personal lives as formerly incarcerated people um so first a comment like a big shout out to nicole and dana for always like convening these educational opportunities for the advocates on the ground to really have um a framework in which we can use to push the work um i would agree that this this voting work is re really really local right um and what what we see and what we are committed to is staying the course especially in a place like maryland where you know we have voting rights right individuals sitting in jail pre-trial have the right to vote individuals sitting in jail with misdemeanor convictions have the right to vote and individuals no matter how many felonies they have have the right to vote once released but what we're finding is that the State Board of Elections and the Department of Corrections are not doing their part to uh, implement this program appropriately through policy recommendations, right? And so, you know, we just really appreciate those advocates that come along that are willing to support the work and the groundwork that was already laid out, as opposed to, you know, wanting to jump on board with like some sexy new, let's put polls in jails without even really looking at the landscape of the jail that you're talking about. 
And so like in a place like Baltimore, our local free, free, free release facility, they can't even get relief right, right? They can't even get like the basic things right um, pre-COVID. And so how would that really look to put a, uh, a voting site when you don't even have policy around like the existing law? And so I just urge people around the country to really think critically about the next steps to voting and all in the, and I know that, you know, some of this work sounds really, really sexy, but I promise we will get there if you, if we just stay the course to ensure that one, the elected officials who sponsor the legislation, they're doing the hard work of ensuring implementation and that the agencies are working together to make sure that people behind the walls have, have actual education around voting and, and access to the ballot. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for the comments and the suggestions. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? I have one. Hey, Darrell. Hey. So uh, I want to reiterate uh, her comments. Um, thank you, Nicole and Dana, for convening all of us and all the work that you guys are doing and everybody else that's on this call. Um, the one thing I wanted to say, uh, Bun B and Trey are two rappers that are well known and they actually put together a PSA for us that we're gonna have in our jails. And I would, like, we're willing to share that with anyone. Um, it just shares the basics for the rules in Texas. That applies for your state. And it's something that you'd like to add to your kit. Um, I'll drop my email address and we'll, we're, we're free to share that as well. Thank you, Darrell. So one person um, posted, I guess it was you, Mike, that said this. Um, that juveniles, you know, young adults, folks who turn 18 who are incarcerated, and they can vote and, you know, should be encouraged to vote if not helped with registration. So that's a constituency to definitely be connected to and to be working with um, leading, up to, leading up to the election. Mike, do you have any tips on that or any suggestions? Yeah, you know, one, one thing I would uh, encourage people to look at that we did in Ohio is a lot of those um, juvenile detention centers, they have um, public schools that service them. And in Ohio, we have state law requirements that public schools are supposed to provide voter registration information. None of them do it in the juvenile detention center. And so I think that that's a, a, a little nudge that you can give to the public schools that serve detention centers and also to the state that they have a duty to make sure those young people have information. And then we uh, uh, started working uh, uh, right as I was leaving All Voting is Local with some local uh, juvenile justice advocates to have young people themselves go in there and talk to the, to the young folks. So again, it's, it's all about that cultural competency and having peers talking to other peers um, about the importance of voting. Um, if I could also uh, add just one thing. So I've seen a lot in the chat that people are talking about these really frustrating logistical issues, right, that come from jail bureaucracy. Like, can you bring in a stamp? Can you bring in the, the right kind of pen to fill out this form that requires them to accept it? And in a lot of states, those kinds of things can be um, just completely, completely bar your efforts, right? Like, if you can't bring in the right pen, you can't do the work um, unless someone says that they're going to accept it. And so one of the ways that we help, right, like I'm a lawyer, is that we, we can write these, these sort of like legally threatening letters, right? Like we put, a, we put it on fancy letterhead and we say the Constitution requires that you provide eligible voters a means to vote from jail, which is true. Um, there was a Supreme Court case in the early 70s called O'Brien versus Skinner that guaranteed that right. And so, you know, whatever the, the local laws are, sort of doesn't matter. They have to make some ac accommodation that makes voting possible. And so in the, the library of resources that I think Nicole is gonna be throwing into the chat um, shortly, we've provided also an example of the kinds of advocacy letters. There, there's different kinds of advocacy letters, right? There's an advocacy letter that is like um, nice and it says, hey, we're just reminding you of this obligation, please do this. And then there's an advocacy letter, the carrot and the stick, right? The stick letter where you say, you are failing in this, in this constitutional obligation that you have and your inability to make an accommodation um, around a stamp issue, around a pen issue um, is illegal. And so, you know, 
you need to make a change. And so we've provided those resources for you to give you templates to write letters like that of your own um, if you need to. And also if it would be helpful to have additional sort of legal support or your you know fancy letterhead from us or one of our partner organizations, you should please feel free to reach out to us because there are plenty of voting rights lawyers who would be happy to, to help you with that kind of um, support. Yeah, so, you know, Dana and I are offering to be resources and to help you all with technical support. This is going to, a lot of this, though, will depend on your motivation and your self-drivenness, right? So there's only so much capacity that Dana and I have. We hope that the Google Drive as a starting place provides sample letters, uh, provides toolkits and advocacy reports that offer recommendations and best practices. You know, we're happy to have one-on-one -on -one discussions with you all. But in order for these to be effective campaigns, I will be relying on your leadership um, from your community, hopefully in collaboration with some of your uh, state partners, your local partners that you're meeting, some of you are meeting for the first time on this, in this virtual meeting, and that we hope to support connections to um, ongoing, going forward between now and November and beyond. Um, so are, were there any other questions or comments as we uh, get to the top of the hour and want to encourage you all to post what next actions, um, steps you can take or you're willing to take um, going forward? Any other questions or comments? Yeah, this is Reverend Michelle. Can you hear me? We can, Reverend Michelle. Hello. All right, good. So I just wanted to jump on real quick. I was kind of multitasking here through the meeting, and this is the second time I jumped on, and this is my first time. So I want to take up that offer to get some individual support. I'm in Philly, and I just got a burden to make sure that the Philly jails and the women in there, you know, get these registration forms and be able to register to vote. So I was wondering, like, can I get connected to maybe who already doing the work? And, um, you know, just just really the support. I'm listening in. I'm going to look at the Google, uh, the Google Doc, but I'm really probably going to need that one-on-one -on -one support. Okay. Because, uh, so I'll, well, I'll follow up with you. There's a lot of great work happening in Philadelphia that's been going on for a long time, so I'll point you to, the, to that information and then support you in what next steps you're interested in, in taking. But as we get to the top of the hour, can I just invite people to share out what next step they're willing to take? going forward. I guess uh, since I'm speaking this rev again, have a one on one with you. <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone else? You know, in Maryland, we're working um, uh, with Dana to work on a letter to re engage our state board of elections because they messed up the Maryland election horribly here in Baltimore. Specifically, we were one of the counties that got our ballot the cities that got our ballots extremely late i mean it was disgusting the way they treated voters here in baltimore and so they had vowed that they would be better and they even vowed that they would work with the reentry community and so you know our next letter that we're going to put out is saying hey you publicly uh um stated that you were with us yeah. you were working with the reentry community to ensure ballot access we're calling you on that and we you know we want to meet and we want a discussion to give you our thing and how we think this should look behind the walls great thank you nicole so we're at the top of the hour uh, there's a lot of people who are looking for individual conversations so um we'll work to follow up with you all one-on-one -on -one and schedule those any last comments as we come to a close any commitments that people are willing to make Nicole. Go ahead. You hear me? This is Britta from the DC area and I just wanted to, you might have seen my colleague uh, Kathy in the chat reaching out to everybody because there was a, as many of you will know, uh, historic progress in the DC area that everybody with a felony conviction will be able to vote, but a lot of those people are, in fact, all of those, almost all of those people are not here. They are in federal prisons across the country. So if any, um, I guess our commitment is that we'll be trying to do what we can to uh, work with 
contact here in the Board of Elections is, uh, and the Department of Corrections to reach out to those people, but it's going to be a massive uphill battle. So if anybody has lo um, is working in federal prisons and um, instead of in their jails, then it'd be great to connect and see how we can reach. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, there's very little capacity for that around the country, but as you know, we'll, we'll follow up with you on that directly. So, right. so I think we're at the end. Um, I'm gonna offer Dana and Mike uh, the last few comments here to, as we wrap up the call this afternoon. So we'll go to you first, Dana, and then to you, Mike. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody so much for taking the time to join us and participate. Um, I see some questions about the recording of this call, which we will circulate afterwards, um, in addition to uh, circulating a library of resources so you have them at your disposal moving forward. But also, please, please do feel free to reach out to, to me or anyone else um, just to sort of think if you need any support, um, if you want to sort of think through or get connected with, with someone, we'll do our best to, to make that happen. So um, thank you everyone for, for engaging on this and we're excited to work with you moving forward. And I just want to thank Dana and Nicole for inviting me uh, here. Um, you all really inspire me. I think that this is some of the most important uh, work that we can be doing out in our communities right now. And, um, you know, this is really hyper local and hyper important work. And so, you know, you all are the key to making this happen. And um, I just appreciate all of you being here. Great, thank you guys. So we'll wrap up here. It's not- Can you all hold up? We're trying to get the information out the chat. The chat will be saved. Yeah, I mean, oh, okay. we'll, we'll, yeah, we're just gonna wrap up the call and people can yeah. sign up. If people um, wanna stay on for a few minutes to get information or save the chat, we wanna welcome you to do that. And then we'll save the transcript from the chat in the Google Drive as well. Thank so you. that you can access it later. Um, thank you all for your time this afternoon. This is the beginning of the conversation. Um, I will reshare the Google Drive in the chat before we wrap up and feel free to follow up. Um, so this is the end of the call, but I'll stay on for a few minutes and maybe Dana and Mike have time to stay on for a few minutes as well and uh, to answer any other questions that we didn't get to and just to support people in any feedback or comments that they might have okay but thank you all for your time and you know we'll continue to be in touch particularly as we get close to november the girls they got an hour to go when they when they was in dc can you see this all right so uh, for those who are still on the call any comments or other questions that we didn't get to during the actual meeting yeah, I wanted to know what 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 are you all's um, advice around like some of these tech acts that are coming out around like voting work, and do you all have any recommendations on what tech groups we should be working with and which ones we shouldn't be working with? I don't know. Tech groups? I don't know, Dana or Mike or anyone else. It doesn't just have to be the three of us, but anyone else? Any reactions to that? I had a different one. I was going to ask, um, do you guys have like a directory or would that be cool to have like a sign in sheet so that some of us could crisscross? Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing we could do is maybe um, we didn't ask this, so I don't know what the maybe um, maybe we can follow up with people directly to make sure that it's OK, but share contact information. Um, you know, figure out a way to do that so that it's easy to um, access and to and to connect with people on. Well, if the sentencing project is willing to receive emails from participants asking to connect with specific attendees, then that will cover you know you because all you have to do is to then forward that information to the attendee. Yeah, I mean Just one thing I'm gonna, around. one thing I'm going to do is go through the chat and try to. I try to make connections based on some of the interactions in the chat mm -hmm. and then yeah i think it's a, i think as a follow-up can, can ask that question directly and then offer to make those connections to people too okay i may be missing things so if 
there are questions that people have, feel free to just chime in and mute yourself and chime in. Okay, I have something here. Um, it's a letter I received from my sheriff's department. I just wanted to share it in case it would help somebody. Um, the Lee County Sheriff's Office received mail-in ballots as well as literature from the Supervisor of Elections Office to provide to incarcerated registered voters in Lee County. Our re-entry specialists will be working with any individuals needing assistance with the process. And then she asks if there's any other information I need regarding this matter, please don't hesitate to reach out. So um, what would be a next step for me on that? See, Allison, if I may, uh, you might want to connect with the sheriff's office to tell them that their list may have individuals who are no longer at the jail. Second, that there are individuals in the jail who, who, who entered the jail after their list was generated. Third, I don't know how it's happening in your county, but here in Santa Clara County, California, they have seized all in-person programming at our local county jail. And so even our rehabilitation officers and our reentry specialists, sorry, it's the trash drop. Um, so our reentry specialists are not able to meet in person with any inmates. So we are working locally with our registrar of voters and our public defenders to find a way to do voters ed and actual registrations. So there are three concrete pieces that you can connect back with them on that I can suggest based on the local work we're trying to do. Yeah, because the, I first uh, reached out to the um, supervisor of elections who said that because of the COVID that they were not planning on entering the prisons, but then the sheriff's department was who I contacted after I got this letter, so. Yeah, and the sheriff's department, their, their rosters are so old, and we must remember that people cycle in and out on a regular basis from local county jails. And most people, as somebody said in an email earlier, most people are able to, to, to vote if they're in the jail because they haven't yet been convicted. And so, yeah. I will also say that it's not uncommon for clerks and sheriffs to try and pass the buck off on each other to say like, oh, well, this isn't my job. It's the recorder's job or this isn't my job it's the sheriff's job and then you create a loop and so sometimes there is benefits to trying to put everyone on the same chain and say listen there is an out like the state and the county have an obligation to do this and so however you do it you know you need to be talking to each other and working together to make sure this gets done that's such a good point, Dana, because we work for the, I'm part of the county administration and I'm the Office of Women's Policy as part of the business side of the county. So we are in fact uh, at uh, 10 o'clock on Friday, day after tomorrow, we have the registrar of voter, the, the public defender, uh, two of our sheriffs and Office of Women's Policy all on the same call, trying to make it work because they're all just putting us in circles. And we have, we, we have, we worry that this won't happen soon enough because the last day to register the vote is October 3rd. Thankfully, because we're a Voters' Choice Act uh, state, you can actually vote provisionally on the day of the, uh, on, on, on any of the election days, but it's so complicated. Um, so yeah, Allison, good luck. Okay, hey, any other comments or questions or reactions as we wrap up the call this evening, this afternoon? Uh, I just wanna say uh, I'm in Florida, so I got my work cut out for me. You do. <laughs> no, I, I actually, I know someone mentioned Florida um, and I know that the, the state ACLU there has been very interested in jail voting and has produce some jail voting materials in the past. I work um, I with them. Um, I meet with them every two weeks. I've been, oh, that's how I got involved in, with this is through uh, ACLU Florida. 
So I have a lot of, and I, did, and I use the ACLU Ohio toolkit as a basis for a lot of what I'm doing. Are you connected with formerly incarcerated people down there in Florida? I have not yet connected with any incarcerated individuals, but um, that would be one of my next steps. Yeah. Is actually go getting into the jails, which well, I- Well, not necessarily getting into the jails, but, but I'm sure that there are some people who have been doing the work in Florida that have been impacted by prison and jail that you should let guide your movements and your work as they can help inform you how to go in those jails, how to talk to us, right? So I think that's where most people skip us when it comes to this work, but we shouldn't be the ones skip, right? We should be the first people you go to when you're doing this kind of work, you know, because we've been there. So. And somebody posted in the chat, Shad, if I'm, hope I'm saying your name right, the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, which is the group that anchored Amendment 4 back in 2018 and is continuing to do voter registration and fighting the good fight around ensuring ballot access going into the 2020 okay. election. So okay. Allison, my understanding is, is that they have, I don't know if they call them chapters or units, but they have them throughout the state and should be a great uh, partner in your work in the county that you're um, working in. So I hope, and if you, can't find a connection there, um, do reach out to me. I have some uh, contacts there that I can um, help you with. Anyone else? Thank you all for continuing to stay on the call. We have you know, more, close to 30 people still on, more than 13 minutes after uh, the call was scheduled to end. So thank you for your time. Any other comments or feedback um, before we wrap up? None. Okay. Well, maybe this now is a good stopping uh, point. Again, there is the Google Drive where resources will be shared. Uh, we can continue to share the link if you um, miss it and, and don't and no longer have access to it. And then we will be scheduling additional meetings such as this. So uh, we'll figure out a way to identify what the content of future meetings could be. The next suggested meeting that Dana is going to be organizing will be a policy focused discussion that looks at policy solutions uh, perhaps that coalitions and organizers can focus on at the state level and maybe within localities so that will be the next scheduled discussion and then we'll identify other discussions that we can mobilize and strategize around particularly in support of the election um, this november so with that we can wrap up i'll uh, in the meeting, um, which will end the meeting for all, but it's not the end of our discussion because we'll continue to look for ways to collaborate and support your work going forward. Okay. Thanks a lot, Nicole. All right. Thanks, Thanks Mike. All. So stay well, stay healthy, and bye-bye.